Hello, I'm Kate Fitzgerald from the Learning Hack team, welcoming you to a new episode of Great Minds on Learning. In this series, Donald Clark, the internationally famous author, blogger and entrepreneur, joins John Helmer to explore two and a half thousand years of thought and theorising about learning from the Greeks to the geeks. This episode covers the thinking behind workflow learning, a hot topic these days. In a world where technology delivers fast, personalised information at the point of need, does it really make sense any longer to think of a course as the default unit of learning? In June 2018, the analyst Josh Bursin wrote... A new paradigm has arrived, one I call learning in the flow of work. And since Josh Burson is an extremely high profile and influential analyst, suddenly learning in the flow of work was buzz phrase of the month, of the year, still with us. But that's not really the beginning of the story when it comes to workflow learning, is it? We could trace the idea back to Gloria Geary's 1991 book, Electronic Performance Support Systems, and maybe even further back, um, you'll, you'll tell us about this, Donald. But it's a bit more recent than many of the other ideas we've featured on this podcast, um, you know, given that the podcast goes back to Aristotle and Plato and so on, because it's triggered learning in the flow work by the existence of network computers and, of course, the Internet. And the affordances of those technologies are what really makes it available and possible. So it kind of starts there, I, I think. I'm hoping I'm right there. Yeah. As a sign, perhaps, of how recent the idea is, I have to announce a significant first for the Great Minds on Learning podcast. Everybody we're talking about today is still alive. At the time of recording, anyway. Two of of these people have been guests on the Learning Hack podcast so far, and I've got my eye on at least another one of the others. So, Donald, give us an overview, please, of how you formed this group and maybe a definition of what it is we're talking about this time. Yeah, sure. When I I was... Really, it's, you know, writing this and looking at all the research on this, actually, Josh Berson didn't feature at all. He's a real bandwagon guy. He's almost nothing to do with this, to be honest, because the ideas have been around for, oh, really 50 years and longer. And anybody who knows about this area, apart from Josh, obviously, who, but that's a pure marketing thing. It's got nothing to do with the real world, in a sense. It's about Deloitte's selling product. But uh, I think this goes back way back, actually, to the 1970s. And Guy Wallace, who we will be talking about today, uh, mentions two figures in particular, and that's uh, Gary Rumler and Tom Gilbert. They were the first two started talking about worksheets, checklists, documents, uh, uh, you know, what examples, all those sort of things that are really useful, actually, in the workplace and have nothing or almost nothing to do with training. So we had that stuff early on. We, I mean, going back to the 1990s, I can remember, so we have Marsic and Watkins, quite a famous book on informal and incidental learning in the workplace, mm. and that was 1990. Uh, and then uh, you mentioned already Gloria Gary, whom I met, I uh, remember meeting her in Denver. And, and she has a, a, the book is actually very, very good on electronic performance support systems. That's 1991. Jay Cross, of course, spent decades yeah. talking about informal learning. You know, in other words, most of what we learn is through informal means, but we spend all the money on formal courses. You thought this was a ridiculous imbalance on budgets in workplace learning. And then, of course, the people we will be talking about today. But the the good news is that this is a big paradigm shift that's happening right now. Uh, You're getting a shift towards, you know, resources, not courses, uh, learning experience platforms, for example, that play heavily on this idea of allowing the learner to pull stuff rather than getting them to go on a course. So it's, it's very, it's pertinent, it's contemporary. And it's a big shift, not only in the investment community. So, you know, I was involved with Learning Pool for 15 years. That got sold last year for £150 million. That, that's a lot of money because it's off the age. It has the sort of tech that does this. So hopefully we'll be unpacking what this is in essence and uh, looking at some of the detail. Before we get going, can you draw a distinction between informal learning, which is the subject of another episode um, we'll be doing next time, and workflow learning yeah well the formal learning tends to be in very simple colloquial terms those structured courses by and large l and d that's what they've been doing for decades and what they continue to do whether it's in the classroom 
or uh, or online uh, as e-learning in all its various forms. Uh, informal learning it really goes back again. If uh, again, if you have this idea going back to some of the people I mentioned there, informal learning learning can be unintentional, almost unplanned. It's what you learn by simply doing stuff in the workplace. You know. Uh, nobody went on a course in PowerPoint, but we know how to use PowerPoint because we sort of picked it up as we went along. This sort of learning in the workflow, of course, was the model for centuries and the you know guilds and apprenticeships. That's exactly how people learn under the wing of other people, as it were, in the workplace, actually doing things. So the informal learning is that learning by doing incidental, unintentional, unplanned, inadvertent, sometimes even accidental learning. <laughs> you know, they, there are things you pick up uh, en route, uh, not having planned them at all. Whereas formal learning is something that is intentionally planned and executed as such. So workflow learning falls under the banner of formal, does it? Uh, no, workflow, workflow learning is actually a combination. So if, if you've got, if you take LXP or learning experience platforms, for example, you set up a system so that when the learner feels they need something, we'll be talking about this in some detail, then they can go and use a very sophisticated form of search, for example, uh, not just Google search, but searching and interrogating inside videos, documents, PowerPoints, to find just the little bit of thing you need. Mm. You know, nobody ever goes on a course on how to use a printer. You know, we wouldn't go on a week's course on how to use the printer. Uh, but we do look things up when the printer goes wrong. Mm. <laughs> That's the difference between these two things yeah. here. And... Uh, so it's it's largely inform you know most informal learning uh, that's the big deal, and the ratios turn out to be something like seventy to eighty percent informal as opposed to the ten twenty even smaller percentage in some people's minds on formal learning. But the big mistake, of course, which Jay Cross rightly surfaced, is that almost all the budget goes in formal learning, and almost nothing goes in informal learning. Uh, that's changed slightly because we're now getting to grips with this informal stuff and we're providing the sort of technology that we use all the time. Most of us use search, uh, YouTube, Wikipedia, whatever, you know, that's all informal because we're driving it. You, you know, we're driving the car. We're not getting on a bus, as Jay Cross used to say. Most courses are about getting on a bus, which has a set route and is going to a set destination. He's saying actually what most people like to do is buy cars and actually decide on the destination when and go there when they want to, as opposed to some scheduled course, uh, which is equivalent to being on a bus. Electric cars, hopefully. And of course, electric cars. Very interesting. It was a very interesting thing this week. Somebody's, somebody was pointing out that uh, it was on Twitter that Zoom may have uh, may have helped climate change uh, more than electric cars. <laughs> and it was when you're in an electric car, you're still using loads of energy and so on to go somewhere, perhaps, you know, not necessarily a useful thing to do for meetings. Uh, but it may be that Zoom has been the real, the real deal in terms of climate change. I thought it was a very interesting observation. Of course, some energy is used in that and on the internet, but it turns out to be about 7% of the journey. So let's get going. Guy W. Wallace, president of Epic Inc. That's E W P I C, not to be confused with the company that you used to run and where I used to work, Donald. It describes yeah. himself as a semi retired performance analyst and instructional architect, although he seems to be pretty busy if you look at his social media feed. 40 years in the field of learning and development, Guy has been an external consultant since 1982 and has conducted over 250 projects, more than 80 clients, including over 45 Fortune 500 companies, which is quite a haul really in the client list. In 2010, Guy was the recipient of the Honorary Life Member Award from ISPI, the International Society for Performance Improvement. Performance is a big word with Guy and with several other of these people today. Guy's the author of 17 or 18 books, depending on, I think it's 17 on, you've got in your blog, Donald, I saw someone else, 18 books, and over 100 published articles. Highly active on social media, as I said, and an assiduous supporter of this podcast. But there are reasons other than that for considering him a pretty good egg, I gather. Donald, where does Guy fit into the picture with regard to workflow learning? You've started with him, yeah? Yeah, I have, because Guy... 
Guy has been on this kick for all, for decades, you know. In other words, we, you know, you might imagine it's Berson or something, but you know, there are there, there are good people, good practitioners who really have been delivering stuff. And Guy is one of those people who have been uh, beating this drum for a long, long time. And indeed, Guy has published an endless, you know, huge number of books on the area that are fantastic. In fact, I wrote the foreword to his last book. A a and I know Guy. And admire him greatly because he's a practitioner. I like practitioners, people who actually do projects as well as write about it, because you get that empirical, sort of informed view of the real world. But I think Guy focuses on two big things here, which are the two big weaknesses in when you're thinking about how you're going to deliver learning in the workplace. And you might call it top and tailing. The first weakness is that people, in Guy's view, people just don't do enough or the right type of analysis up front in projects so they they then hair off and deliver the wrong stuff the second big thing is at the tail end they don't really understand the difference between performance and schooling and education and learning in other words actually what people in the workplace really need to be able to do is do things you know uh, they need to be able to perform you know whether it's leadership you actually need to do things with your employees as a manager and so on right through to other competencies and he thinks that a lot of training we default into courses all the time which is a bit like going back to school but you're going to forget it all and it's too cognitive and too sort of texty and theoretical and it doesn't really have much application or transfer to the workplace so he thinks that topping and tailing you know good analysis up front with an eye on performance is a big deal and to be honest i think he's right in work workplace learning you know he thinks that l and d are really a bit too classroom focused you know they're a bit schoolish <laughs> and they constantly want to shove people into rooms and take them away from the workplace, but that's where the real action is. So you don't, so they don't really get analysis of real world performance, the real context in which people have to work. They're much more comfortable with flip charts and PowerPoint and sort of didactic stuff, and that's why they they often don't have much knowledge of transfer. For example, the theory of transfer or how people transfer the knowledge they gain and skills they gain uh, to to real situations which they face in the world. So it's much more about finding out what the need is and servicing that need than assuming that everything that, you know, I think he talks about that, you know, quite well-known thing in training the last few years um, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we kind of throw courses at everything. Exactly. and that. So he's pretty fundamental in terms of the people we're talking about. Yes, it, it, I mean, just before, you know, it, on, that, on that notion of, you know, the, just unpacking it a little bit more, he picks up on all sorts of theory from Gilbert, uh, another great favourite of his, who we're just about to talk, talk about is Richard mm. Clark. But I, I think when he talks about performance, he's very precise on this. You know, it's not a sort of woolly concept for Guy mm. at all. He thinks you really have to focus on what people need to know. In other words, what do they actually have to remember you know, there's some stuff that they, or do you just have to produce stuff that's available as resources? So rather than this automatic production of a course, batching people by the dozens through the course, he thinks that you should be defaulting away back to very simple things like job aids or job aids embedded in training, if you do want to go down the training route. And only, only then, you know, after you've exhausted all the little tricks of the trade, do you start thinking about uh, courses and, you know, critical knowledge and skills. So performance, for you need to un unpack performance. What is performance here, you know? He thinks that there's a very definite method that you have to go through. And that, that method involves really understanding your target audience, not having just empathy for them or something, you know? You, you have to look at performance, the gaps, the ideal performance, the gaps in performance, where people get stuck, what enables them to get over the bridges mm -hmm. when they get stuck and the existing uh, content assessments uh, for potential reasons. That's, it's a really interesting one. He's quite often looks at training from the point of view of don't reinvent the wheel. You may already have stuff that's useful or can reuse in the future. So he's constantly looking to short circuit the process and go for a sort of Occam's razor, minimum number of entities to reach your given goal. And I think that's really admirable. And he has a whole methodology about this that we needn't go into today, but you know, about the way in which projects are kicked off, how you do the analysis, the development, the revisions, the files, and so on. But he's, he's an informed guy. And if you want guidance on process around this guy's uh, he, guy, he's, he's the go-to guy, he's the go -to guy. <laughs> for that stuff. You 
mentioned there that uh, one of Guy Wallace's uh, mentors was Richard E. Clark, or one of the people he looks up to, Richard E. Clark. So Richard E. Clark, let's get on to him. Some say that learning has more than its fair share of Clarks, but we say the more the Merriam Boer, the more the Merriam Boer. It's a learning theorist joke. <laughs> People are going to find that funny. Everybody else is staring blankly. Yeah. But with no disrespect to any of the other Clarks, uh, yourself included, Donald, this one is certainly a pretty significant Clark. He's Emeritus Professor of Educational Psychology and Technology in the Rossio School of Education and Emeritus Clinical Research Professor of Surgery in the Keck School of Medicine. A stack of professional honours and awards. Uh, I accessed a selected list of his professional publications and it runs to 21 closely typed pages of A4. <laughs> so he's written an awful lot um, and a lot of papers and collaborations with people like Sweller and so on. Probably Merriam Bowe as well. Says it doesn't really matter which media you use for learning. Quite controversial there. He championed direct instruction. He challenged constructivism. He's a skeptic on games based learning and is an AI optimist. But there's a lot more to his thought besides. Covers a, a wide area. Yeah. Cognitive task analysis is a big thing with him. He's very keen on motivation. Um, Donald, I'm hoping you can sum him up and give us a bit of a handle on this um, this man's oeuvre. But what is his distinctive contribution to our view of workflow learning? It's probably the handle to hang it on. Yeah, yeah. To, to explain the clap joke for people who don't know this, but, and during these podcasts, the name comes up so frequently, it's, it's, it's rather <laughs> odd. So we we've, we had uh, Mamie and Raymond Clark on training about racism. We've had, uh, there's Ruth Clark, another famous theorist. Uh, the guy we're just about to talk about, Richard Clark, and also Andy Clark, who is one of the philosophers who talks about the extended mind. So the word Clark, including my own name, of course, I'm not in the list, but the, uh, the word Clark seems to... Uh, it seems to occur with uncanny sort of regu regularity. But this guy, Richard, I mean, I, I, I really am a great fan of Richard Clark. One, because he is he's a proper academic who really, really does take the empirical evidence first before he accepts anything. So, you know, in any of these topics, whether it's gamification or what we're talking about now, which is performance support, he really draws on the empirical evidence that, uh, uh, that that's available at that time. And that's the right thing to do. He's a real scientist in that sense. Now, his work is really, his primary work is on this sort of cognitive gap analysis thing. And always, if you're delivering learning to people, it would be useful to know what they don't know. <laughs> and that's what it's about. So. All, all this thing about performance gaps, you know, that you really need to know what people don't know before you can deliver the optimal training type solution. So he's also a big advocate of using AI to do this. He doesn't think it's a trivial task and that we may need some help through the mathematics of AI, but we can come to that later. Uh, he, he's a big fan of AI generally in learning. So uh, as you rightly said, he thought that, you know, there was no, I actually disagree with him on this because the research has moved on somewhat since uh, that reconsidering research on learning from media, which is published in the 80s, was led to this no significant difference idea that different types of media didn't really matter. That turns out not to be true. Subsequent research has shown that's wrong, but he held on to that. So you can put that, to be fair, at the time, that's what the research was showing. But remember, this is 1983. This is mm. like 17 years before the internet. So, you know, like, yeah. it, 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 let's be careful with drawing some of that early theory and bringing it forward because I think he would agree that that's changed. He very definitely thought that direct instruction was superior. He thought that social constructivism had absolutely thrown the whole learning world uh, into turmoil almost, you know. Uh, he re and he just said, listen, the, the data is really clear here that direct instruction seems to be more infect more effective than unguided or just letting people discovery learning, you know? You don't teach your kid how to cross the road by simply shoving them out between cars onto the road and letting them find out for themselves. Mm. Uh, he, he really did think that gu lightly guided learning experiences are useful, but actually direct instruction needs to be at the heart of the matter. So he was dead against the constructive approach of, uh, you know, uh, Papert, Brunner and, uh, and those people. Which is why he focuses on this cognitive task analysis idea that, you know, the, the idea that you have to find out what, what, so it's a brilliant book on this called Training Research and Results was all about looking at the motivational and organizational sides of performance. Okay. 
And there's a very odd thing he uncovers in the research, which is if you ask a subject matter expert to explain, you know, a job function, as it were, they miss about 70% of it out. It's very odd, but it's right. The testimony from experts is often quite flawed because they're experts. And actually, they've, they've sort of got 70% of the stuff that has gone into their unconscious. They just perform it automatically and are not yeah. conscious of the steps. So his mm -hmm. method is all about uncovering that missing 70%. And I was, okay, you're a subject matter expert. And I'm sure you've had this experience. I have when designing courses. You walk away with your notes from a subject matter expert and go, is that it? Really? <laughs> and that's because they don't understand all the missing bits in between uh, that they, they do automatically without thinking. But the mm -hmm. novice has to really think about it. So he has a really good method for this that's become quite famous, you know, about how you interview experts or subject matter experts, with a focus on asking the expert, where do they think people get stuck? That tends to uncover the missing 70%. Where do your learners tend to get stuck most often? He then says mm -hmm. you should interview a few of them and then edit all the transcripts, mm -hmm. interview them separately, about three or four was his recommendation. And then that way, by looking at the overlaps, you can find out what's missing. And then yeah. you go back and collapse it all into one single version. And hey, presto, once you've got other, some other stuff about all the equipment you might be needing and so on, you have this ideal cognitive gap analysis, which is, you know, really a detailed understanding of what the thing is you're meant to be tackling as a problem. And didn't he say you should ask expert number two what expert number one missed out? That's right. And, and yeah, if you don't get that, you don't get agreement on a single version, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's right. Uncovering the contradictions in the testimonies from experts is really interesting as well. And I think it's at spot on here. You know, subject matter experts, you can ask one, you can go in and ask another, and you, it's as if it's another job almost, you know. They describe it from a completely different perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, he's big on this multiple sources of information, collapsing it into one final testimony, which you then use to build whatever you're going to build or or whatever method you apply to uh, to, the, to that problem. Now, he's also, I think what's interesting, you may think it's a bit mechanical, you know, a bit sort of robotic, but it's not really because he's really, really big on motivation. Mm -hmm. uh, and he puts a huge amount of emphasis on motivation, which I think is right. And there are a number of different sort of angles on motivation, you know. First of all, there's the, the negative stuff, you know. People get knocked all the time in, in work, you know get made to feel small or told that they, they didn't get it right or whatever. You've really got to iron that out of the system. You know, you've got to get out of being negative towards people. He thinks that those obstacles sort of knock people at one side and are really destructive in learning. And then a second thing, we've talked about this in a previous podcast, is the emotional side of learning. Effective you know, learning, the effective yeah. side. So he thought that that can be, he thinks that this is why he's dead against gamification. He said the last thing you want to do is overstimulate people, get them all g'd up. You know, mm -hmm. actually, when people are overstimulated or you know anxious uh, or negative, whatever you know, there are a whole number of emotions. If you remember that Panksepp in our previous uh, podcast mentioned, he said these are incredibly destructive in learning. These disruptive emotions, so be very careful with that type of stuff. But the two big ones for him are. You know, how do you feel about yourself here? You know, are you confident going forward in learning this stuff? Hey, do you feel that you can get on with the task and complete it and, you know, become that expert if you're a novel, a, a novice, sorry. And then the big one is a sort of values mismatch. And always you're going, you know, God, I'm receiving this training, but it, it just isn't, I know this is not right. It's just not relevant to me or the workplace. You know, in other words, it's some liberal view of the world and you're not necessarily a liberal sort of person, or you're a very liberal person and you don't like this didactic stuff. There's often a mismatch between what your expectations are and what the L&D department are throwing at you, which is usually oodles of compliance training, of course. <laughs> <laughs> which he would, which he hates. He thinks, it's just, well, like most people who look at this with any sensible eye, go, this is bad news. You know, constantly accusing people of having deficits is no way to encourage them to learn how to be better people. And mm -hmm. yet, you know, so much training has become that. So, how do we relate what he's saying here directly to learning and the flow of work, to to workflow learning? Because that. For instance, with the way that you interview SMEs, that could apply to any type of um, 
uh, learning design process, surely. But what, yes. what, why is he specifically in this group? Well, Lake Wallace... Like Guy Wallace, he has exactly the same view of this, which is you're always looking to minimize. When you actually do this analysis properly, you find out that there's loads of stuff that you would have had in the course that you don't actually right. need. Okay. <laughs> and this is this de minimis, Occam's razor, minimum number of entities, you know, things like checklists, job aids, these FAQs, PDFs, whatever, you know, all those things that we read, we use in real life. You know, whenever you get stuck in something, what do you do? You go to Google, you go to YouTube. You know, we, we know how people know how to do this. And with the advent of online resources, of course, this has become the norm. So just like Guy, he thinks that we over egg training courses. Sometimes we under egg it, of course, because we miss out loads of things that we should be teaching them mm. and give them loads of schoolish educational type theory. Uh, it, so both of these uh, theorists think that's where training has gone badly wrong. We're essentially treating training like schooling and education. Hmm. You know, we're giving people theory which they will forget and doesn't really allow them to acquire the skills they need in the workplace. So this intense focus on the cognitive task analysis, on an, an, analysing what needs to be taught, that results in you splitting things up really into courses and resources you know this this is stuff you need to get people to remember for them to achieve automaticity in this is stuff you can deal with a job aid or a you know or a checklist or or, or whatever so that yeah. that's the kick out from the, the the precise focus on what is the performance change we need it's very much a kind of workplace learning um, yeah. way of looking at the world isn't it very different from uh, what we see on the education side yeah, it's, it's three words, really. What do you need to know to, per, to perform a task? You know, that, that's, that's really what this comes down to. They, they're stripping things back uh, so that we don't waste. I mean, I, I personally think billions are wasted in training that goes in one year, out the other, or isn't relevant to people's workplace at all. Mm. And it's got worse. I think uh, the danger here is that training becomes a means of reducing productivity in organizations because people spend all this time doing this stuff that has no big impact on them. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the big mistake here, which is which I also like Guy Wallace also goes on to criticize very concretely some of the th some things that people regard as good and albeit fashionable. The, his, his paper uh, on Games for Learning published about 2000, I can't remember, it was at, at two, mid 2000, 2010 or 11 or something. They that was really on point. And I'll tell you why it was on point, is that he identified the fact that the research is massively flawed because it doesn't include the papers that showed that gamification didn't work. Now, if you actually go back and look at the papers, there are loads of papers that show that game, but people cherry pick the evidence. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. This goes back to no significant gain results in a way. But he, th he thought that the research was actually quite weak Anyway, there weren't that many good papers. And that if you did design a good methodology compare, uh, comparing people who did the game as opposed to people who learned by other means, you would find that the game people would, uh, would come out badly. Now, this is interesting because he had reasons for this. And when he looked at the research, he thought that games were a distraction from the sort of real evidence-based stuff that he's been talking about. He thought they often distracted the mind from this focus on application or performance. OK, mm. uh, and, the, and the games may give you this illusion that life is easy, you know, like, oh, we've done the game. Yeah, that's it. I've learned it because I've got, you know, 16 points and four heart shaped badges. <laughs> you know, he thought that was a real distraction from the real focus on hard learning that you have to do to pick up skills. Uh, and, and also that far easier, less expensive methods are probably better. You know, if you can give somebody a little checklist on how to fill, uh, fix their printer, why on earth would you send them on a one or two hour course and gamify it at great expense? Mm. He just thought there was a lot of fluff around gamification. So he was very skeptical about that, as he was about animated agents, another interesting one that he looked at way back in the day. And I think he's right there. You know, that Mr. Clippy or the thing in the corner. Uh, yeah, you know, that, always like, gets brought up when you start to talk about performance support. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Well, I think people go down the wrong route in performance support. They think that performance support means a little training figure. And it's a very HR and L&D view of the world, isn't it? Oh, you need a trainer on the screen. No, not really. I've got Google and YouTube. I want to cut to the quick in the real material here. And then lastly, uh, with Richard, I think, I mean, Richard, uh, you know, may, you might think he's a bit old school, but boy, 
you know, he's really up to date on the AI and learning research. He thinks that AI could automate all the stuff yes, he's talking about. He's an optimist about. on AI, isn't he? Oh, big time. I mean, he thinks that we're really at, like myself, you know, as you know, I wrote a whole book on it, but uh, and give lots of talks on the subject. But I think people just don't realize what it is and, uh, and the fact that it's already there. Yeah. So, you know, so he really does think this is the big technological revolution in, in learning generally. And I think he's absolutely right there. And some of the, it was very interesting because Richard is involved in a very large research project uh, in his university around automating this critical task analysis process and all the, all the stuff we've been talking mm. about. He thinks AI could vastly help us to do this, uh, to get knowledge out of subject matter experts and get it into shape. But I was also involved in a project doing exactly that this year in parallel, a real project for a real company in Europe. And there we, we, we had a blended learning tool that took all as its inputs, all of the types of learning that you need, you, you know, what type of learning do you need to do? What type of, le what learners have you got? Uh, what resources have you got? And used AI to output an optimal blend. So this stuff's starting to happen. In that sense, guy, a, a Richard Clark has been a prophetic. So moving on to uh, another guest on the Learning Cat podcast, Bob Mosher and Dr. Conrad Godfredson. Bob, Bob Mosher has been active and influential leader in the learning and training industry for over 30 years and is renowned worldwide for his pioneering role in new approaches to learning. You can tell I'm reading this out of the, the biog online. <laughs> He's based in South Carolina. Uh, Bob is CEO, CEO and Chief Learning Evangelist at Apply Synergies. Previously, he was with Microsoft as Director of Learning Strategy and Evangelism. Bob is also a Maisie Fellow, representing the Performance Support Thought Leadership Learning Area as an advisor to the Maisie Centre. Now, his partner, Dr. Conrad Godfredson, is a founding partner and chief learning strategist at the Five Moments of Need, also a senior partner and chief learning strategist at Apply Synergies, so they work really closely together. Uh, though Bob is probably more high profile, as he's often out on the speaking circuit, um, and so on. Con earned his PhD in Instructional Psychology and Technology in 1984. After graduate school, he started working at Standard Oil of Ohio, and that's where he discovered the five moments of learning need. He recognized that there were five moments of learning need, which I hope you'll outline for us, Donald. And he began pioneering a performance-based approach to instructional systems design. So after leaving Standard Oil, he began an independent consulting practice. He's also an accomplished author and speaker. So, Donald, can you tell us about the five moments of need and what this duo build on top of that observation with regards to workflow learning? Yeah, sure, yeah. So, I know Bob uh, very well. He's a good friend of mine, and uh, you really have to see Bob speak. He's oh, so he's passionate great. about this yeah. subject. <laughs> yeah, he, but he's passionate because I think he's right. <laughs> I mean, you know, he thinks that this is so important and yet so often ignored, you know, the fact that as we've been saying, most learning doesn't take place because of training courses. It takes place on the job. You know, we start to learn by doing stuff, you know. And so on this notion of, you know, bringing performance support to the table, uh, both these guys have a whole number of different techniques and so on that are all built around this moments and need idea. And so these are all things that will reduce costs, for example. It will reduce the time taken to train people. Uh, and they constantly bash on about this. And, and it's just a shame that more people don't listen to them. Because if we did this, we would save a pile of money and increase increase the efficacy of L&D, I think, enormously. So the, at the heart of the matter for them are these five moments of need. And the five moments of need is a nice, simple mantra. And it's beautiful, it's beautiful because I think it just hits, hits the nail on the head. It really does hit the nail on the head. Now, those these five are new, more, apply... Solve and okay. change, new, more, applied, okay. solve and change. And just to, to explain what those are. So the news, you know, like you're coming across something for the first time, you know, like, I don't know what is blockchain. I've never heard of blockchain. So that's new stuff. That's obviously, you would go and maybe find find out about that. You may go to Wikipedia or a YouTube video if it's a skill or whatever. Then there's more, you know, in other words, you want to take a little bit more of a deep dive. And I was, okay, I've picked that up, but actually I need to know a wee bit more about this because it's not enough just knowing a kernel. And then there's the people who want to apply stuff. Say, okay, I know this, but how do I actually do it? I've got to interview somebody, and I know about open and closed questions, but how do I actually do that in the interview when this person walks through the door tomorrow? 
Uh, that's number three, applying that. And then the fourth, the fourth one is is solving. And was, that's normally when something goes wrong. You know, crap, my printer, I, like, it's not working. <laughs> it's it's like, interesting. Is it? You keep is bringing up the printer. Happening? I think so many of us have had problems with printers. <laughs> no, you know what? This is this is only because I had a nightmare with a printer yesterday, so it's yeah. fresh in my mind. But that's what workflow learning is about. Is what what do you need on that day? You know, it's a, it's a perfect illustration of what what I'm talking about here. Because I had this nightmarish problem mm -hmm. with a printer, uh, which I solved by going online and downloading the the new update. Of course, uh, it wasn't a cartridge problem mm -hmm. at all. But you know, when something goes wrong, that's his fourth one. So we had new, more apply solving something where, where you have to get a pro you know something done really quickly. And then the fifth one is change. And I think that's one of the really interesting one, ones for Bob and Gottfried, because a change in an organization might be you get bought by another company, suddenly you've got to learn a whole load of new stuff. So it might be a new product. You might have a new manager, a new team. Also, you know, the change is often a big catalyst mm -hmm. uh, for learning. So they've got new, more, apply, solve, change, the five moments in need. And around all this, they think it's not that uh, most people think of new and more. That's the problem with training. It focuses on the first two, whereas the last three are probably a greater proportion of what real learners in the real world actually okay. need. So he thinks in order to deliver this, that you have to orchestrate them all. You have to have these combinations of things that you allow the user to pull stuff towards them when they need it, uh, like search, uh, like looking at YouTube, whatever. Uh, but also pushing stuff that may be notifications or nudge learning, any of those things that we're, we're going to be talking about here. And of course, this goes back to the same thing that we've talked about with the two previous theorists. And that is that most learning takes place on the job and not in training courses. But there are techniques you can still use that really make this performance first approach work. If you have absolute focus on the on that positive side of uh, of looking at the world from the far end, and was what are you expecting these people to actually do in terms of performance and productivity? And I mean, the the thing that Bob goes on about is this training mindset. We have to get L and D out of a training mindset about building an instructional system, hundreds of courses, mostly courses. You know, taking orders for courses. To, you know, if that's all you've got in your menu then you're missing out what you really need to be doing here. And that's focusing on what's important to people in their job and how you solve problems on the fly and in real time, which is why newer technology has come along to solve this problem. You know, so, so, and learning, learning in the flow of work is often about, you know, the little hesitancies, mistakes and stuff that people come across, getting stuck. <laughs> you know, that's what the real driver is, the real flywheel mm. in learning. It's not what people think it is. Oh yeah, I really want to. I really want to go on that ethics course, that compliance course, because I think I'm a bit, you know, I feel as though I've been a bit non-compliant last week. It's, there's no motivation to do any of that stuff. What really drives people is when they sometimes fail at something and don't want to fail in the future. They make a mistake, don't want to make the same mistake, or or they get stuck. Uh, that's what all this is about. Now, I think what I really like about Bob. Uh, also is how practical their advice is. Yeah. <laughs> to give you an example, on performance support, they have this rule about two clicks in yeah. 10 seconds, <laughs> which is a great line, which is if you get stuck, you should be able to find the answer within two clicks mm. in 10 seconds. They think that's a sort of upper envelope on performance support. And I think it's a really good rule if you can, you can time this to see, because if you don't find it within 10 se seconds, you tend to get, you tend to, you know, just move on as it were. Now, they also have a sort of hierarchy of steps to solve problems for people, which is really nice. And the first basic one is just supporting knowledge, you know, uh, 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 documents, policies, procedures, job mm. aids, uh, frequently asked questions, checklists, all that sort of stuff. You know, none of that is e-learning or formal training in any sense, but he thinks that that's what practically most people want and use anyway. So why not provide it for them before you shove them on a training mm. course? And only as a last resort do you go into people, chat, social networks, communities of practice, all that high flute and stuff. He thinks they, they, most of these theorists think there are some basic solutions to problems that are largely ignored. And that's what, again, coming back to these learning experience platforms are trying mm. to do. As I'm listening to you uh, now, I'm, I'm, I'm staring at a piece of equipment that has the, the, the same company name on it as uh, who made my printer. 
I'm thinking the people who really need to hear this stuff aren't L and D. <laughs> They're the people who made our printer because the software produced by the company who are, remain nameless is just absolutely appalling. The manual completely appalling. You know, two clicks and ten seconds. Yes, printer manufacturer. That's what we want. We don't want to wade through a million different kind of potential applications we might bolt on. We want to know how to fix the darn thing. Yeah. You think we'd have learned that lesson, isn't it? Nobody reads the manual. Nobody There's a reason for that. The they're rubbish. It's just <laughs> because they're rubbish. But even to be honest, when they're yeah. quite well written, so for the IKEA problem is an interesting one. You know, we get this IKEA thing. And actually, the IKEA diagrams are okay. And of course, I Almost everybody goes through the process of putting the wrong bit in the wrong hole or whatever because they yeah. didn't look at the the because there's hardly any text in the diagram. Then you go back and fix it. So it's just that it's not the way people think. You know, when they have a problem, they want a really quick solution, and that's the trick here. This Occam's razor idea is the principle I love in learning. You know, the minimum number of entities yeah. to reach your given given goal. They want something as quick as possible. And of course, normally, if there's somebody on hand who knows it, you just turn to them and ask which is what happens in a workplace a lot. Uh, but we tend to go to the other extreme and say, no, what we need is a, a full day course, eight hours of this stuff, which is <laughs> like the manual yeah, cubed. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's not give them the manual, give them the history of the manual. And then, you know, then lock them in a room to read the manual all day uh, as if that's going to help yeah. in any way. Uh, a lot of classroom training is just the manual prettified into PowerPoints. So moving on, Richard Thaler, I think, I hope I pronounced that name correctly, born in 1945, good to have some birth dates, and Cass Sunstein, born in 1954. These two are the most famous in this group. Their work is known far outside the confines of our field of learning, most notably in behavioural economics, where their contribution to the field sparked a revolution in the way economists saw the world, although their influence has been far more wide, widely felt even than that. They are co-authors of the hugely influential book Nudge, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth and Happiness, and thus the originators of Nudge Theory. Richard Thaler is an American economist and the Charles R. Walgreen Distinguished Service Professor of Behavioural Science and Economics at the University of Chicago, but more significantly, he's a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. He spent a year at Stanford University collaborating and researching with Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, uh, a duo that we featured in the um, episode nine of this podcast about effective learning. And there, there is yet another kind of link to um, effective learning in this uh, category, which I think is really interesting. Cass Sunstein, his partner, is an American legal scholar, um, a, a very well-cited legal, legal scholar. He was a professor at the University of Chicago Law School 27 years uh, and was part of the Obama administration as administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. Since leaving the White House, Sunstein has been the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard Law School. Donald, number 10 under Cameron, had a nu that's our Prime Minister Cameron, had a nudge unit, and it possibly still does, as far as I know. So these are ideas that found their way to the very heart of uh, two very large Western governments, and many other governments as well. But what does nudge and its particular brand of libertarian paternalism bring to wor workflow learning? Yeah, so we have a Nobel Prize winner here, so that, that may, may you know make us look up a little mm. bit because that's interesting. Building on the previous work with Kahneman Tversky, of course, whom we've discussed, another Nobel Prize winner. So this stuff's quite important theoretically. And so if you imagine this workplace learning problem, in other words, I'm sitting there and I need help on something, you can either pull it uh, through search, there's some other methods you can use in assistance as well, but you can pull stuff towards you if you want to pull them out, pull it out to get you help, or you can have stuff pushed to you. So it's a pull and push problem, the learning experience design problem around workplace support or performance support. Now they're talking about push, a nudge is a push, your notifications are nudging people to do something. And of course the famous example was the little a uh, little flying Schiphol airport in Amsterdam. So in every ma man's urinal they put a little fly in so that uh, so that uh, you know you 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 as every man has got a slightly competitive instinct, <laughs> you you aim for the fly. And then they measured the amount of spillage over the side in front of the urinal and found it reduced spillage by 80%, mm. so the claim goes. Uh, 
I, that was the example they quoted in their book, but there have been hundreds and hundreds of other examples. And of course, that then spilled over into learning. Uh, so we have nudge theory applied to learning. And you're right, the government still has nudge unit is its sort of nickname, but it's the behavioral mm. economics unit. And they have a specific methodology called EAST, which we'll possibly come to uh, in a moment, actually. But uh, to go back to... Uh, uh, back, back, back to these two guys. You're absolutely right. The book Nudge itself came out in 2008. It has had enormous influence in all sorts of areas of human endeavour, whether it be in marketing, finance, health, and so on. But also, uh, it, it maybe less so in learning. But I think that's just the fact that we failed to pick up on this theory quick enough. But the learning experience platforms, uh, LXPs, are starting to do this sort of stuff. So very much like Kahneman and Tversky on thinking fast and slow, uh, they, they, they have a sort of recommendation around trying to avoid these biases or faults that we constant or mistakes we tend to make. So they have a sort of methodology around decision making <laughs> or the sort of architecture that you need to put around learners or people in general to make them, uh, a, to move them or nudge them in the right direction. OK, and there's some basic things that you, we know about. Expect people to make mistakes, you know, to err is human. So, uh, you know, just automatically assume that that's going to be the mistake, that they are going to, you know, a, a, you know, that they are going to at a urinal spill some stuff over the side because they're inattentive, you know. And, and think in terms of defaults, people will just take the path of least resistance. It's that, that sort of thing, you know, somebody's got a nice a nice path towards the faculty door, but actually the students cut across cut across at a diagonal across the lawn, and you can see it inscribed in the grass. Called desire lines, I think. The, the architects are moving to use those to, oh, oh, we might as well put a path there because that's a desire line. That, that's in, exactly it, yeah. I forgot, I'd forgotten that, the, the, the technical term for that, John. Thanks for that. The, so the, the, they're big in believing, of, you know, they have this process called mapping, which is used by UX design people, which is that mapping of the sort of actual outcomes that you expect people to, to use here. They also think you have to really simplify this stuff, you know, right, right get it down to basics and don't overcomplicate things because in real life, because people take the path of least resistance, if you overcomplicate it, they will do nothing. They'll just get, they'll, they'll be like rabbits in the headline. And then of course, feedback as well. Now, a nice thing about, Thaler uh, and Sustine is that they they went back into the history of psychology and used some interesting stuff in the past. And this is a really fascinating bit of psychology here by Ash. That's A S C H in a paper, nineteen ninety five. And they built a lot on this finding, which is that if you get people, if you ask somebody a question on their own, they might get the correct answer. Okay, uh, uh, but if you show them that another group has got wildly different set of answers, they start getting very conformist. It's a general piece of psychology around groupthink. In other words, mm -hmm. as soon as you get social pressure on people, they will say the most outrageous things and believe them just because the group said it. <laughs> you know, two plus two equals five. If everybody around about you is saying two plus two equals five, you find yourself believing that two plus two equals five. Now, the research that Thaler then looked at was that this happens about 20 to 40% of the time. And it was groupthink is an enormous pressure on people, as is peer pressure, okay? Which we explored in brilliant detail by Judith Harris previously. Yeah. Now, Sheriff, another paper, this goes way back in psychology, found that this group effect, this groupthink, was really powerful, at its most powerful, in smaller groups. This is really relevant for training. So you know all that little, let's all sit around, let's all split up into little groups of three and four and sit around the table. Worst thing you could possibly do, because what you start doing is getting a massive amount of groupthink. You're almost distilling groupthink by doing this. You're not getting diversity of thought at all. Now, when the, the great breakthrough, I think, on behavioral economics was people like Thaler and Sustine and others came up and methodologies emerged. So let's pick one because there are half a dozen of these, but the UK government's EAST methodology. So that's E-A-S-T. Uh, uh, mm, an acronym? It is an acronym, yeah. And that means easy, attractive, social, and timely. So right. whatever you're going to do, you know, I think it's an, it is, I've actually used this in design in a design context, and I think it works for nudge learning. Keep it short and easy. You know, don't over-egg this. It may be just 
showing a 15 second TikTok vid type video, you know, rather than a five minute video. Uh, mm. Make it attractive. I think, you know, there's something in that around making learning experiences look good, drawing attention to things like the little fly in the urinal. You know, you've got to get people's attention or they don't learn anything. The third one is social, but using it carefully and not in the group think fashion. Uh, a good example of that is on Duolingo. You know, you get these notifications and when you're using Duolingo and it will say something like, 33% of the people who got to the stage go on to stage four and do really well in learning the language. So you get that, oh, well, God, I'd, I'd like to be part of that group. I'd like to have more success. And you're bootstrapping or pulling people along through social pressure. We do get this formulation again and again now, more, more and more. And I'm sure it's a direct result of the popularity of nudge theories that, you know, 80% of the people who, you know, completed this course and, you know, yeah, so on. I think the, the trouble is you got habituation, so people get fed up with that after a while and stop believing it. So you've got to do it in a very sparing fashion, which why it goes, why it goes back to this Occam's razor minimum number of entities thing. But learning nudges in themselves, you know, I think that we're starting to see this emerge. And I've written about, I've given a lot, you know, in my blog, lots of examples of learning nudges because I think they do work. The one I really liked uh, was one in a finance institution, which is little tiny short videos. They had two massive financial companies slammed together they wanted to rejig their management training so they send them out little monday morning videos you know uh like uh this is what mentoring is this is how mentoring differs from let's say counseling and then at the end I had a little call for action and said right go and mentor somebody in your team i want you to pick one of the youngest members of the team and mentor them for a week and come back and report at the end of the week that sort of thing i think is a, a, a is a brilliant example of nudge learning because it's not invasive. It's not dragging people out onto a course. It has a call to action and they're actually doing something for real. Hmm. So I think, you know, the, uh, I, I think the nudge learning thing is working quite well. And of course, Duolingo is perhaps the most obvious example of this where you're getting your little five minute nudge every morning. I mean, a friend of mine is now on something like 536 days consecutive days in learning Spanish wow. <laughs> and, that's, and he loves that little nudge because quite often you wake up you just forget you know so, yeah, and yeah. you just need that little prompt as it were yeah how about the the negatives in this though I mean, I mean you know in the first place it has a rather it uh, uh depressing kind of view of human nature right it's very counter to the enlightenment values we we're talking about um, even, even if perhaps it's true but people say it's coercive um it's the return of a kind of paternalism into organizations and so on. Um, do, do you think those criticisms are valid? Yeah, I think sometimes we tip over, you know, it, it, it's like calling everybody a Nazi or something, you know, when they're clearly not Nazis. You know? I, th I think, I think the sort of, it, it, to be fair, there is a danger of it being sort of paternalistic or manipulative in some way. I think there's definitely a danger in that. But by and large, you know, what do we do in education? We lock people up in, in school rooms for 13 years of their life and then another four years in lecture rooms. It's not as if the educational system is not, you know, is not coercive in any way. In a Foucaultian sense, you know, there is a prison-like uh, atmosphere mm. to the whole thing. So I think very often we look at online stuff and go, yeah, that's manipulative, that's paternalism, forgetting that most actual, you know, classroom-based training is there's nothing worse than just locking people up and forcing them, you know, say, open your mouth and I'm going to deliver the next couple of hours via PowerPoint and tell you that actually you, you're you you're wrong on all sorts of things. You don't understand diversity, uh, equality, and work. you know, this accusatory view, I think is far worse than nudging people towards the realization that they, yeah, they may be wrong and that they may need to change process and so on. So I think it's better than the alternative because at the end of the day learning has to be a change in long-term memory you know you really have to affect people's minds and there are different means to that end i think this is quite light touch as opposed to great bouts of training which are a heavy touch you know it's that are, are leaden in their approach so I, mm. I don't really have much of a problem with this unless it becomes invidious you know where uh, a good example would be, let's say, you know, some disinformation campaign with a million bots on the internet that are trying to change people's minds. You can see why this is a mistake, but that then almost becomes a mass campaign of direct instruction. <laughs> hmm. uh, and there are ways around that one.
So moving on to the last, but certainly not the least of our theorists, um, your friend of mine, Charles Jennings. He's been interviewed on the on the podcast, and I've bumped into him uh, throughout my career, one way or another, in learning. Born in Australia, I think, but definitely from Australia. Attended the University of Sydney. Uh, career highlights: He was chief learning officer at Reuters and Thomson Reuters. Uh, consultant with Global Companies, Director of Strategic Technology for the Transaction Division of Dow Jones Markets. He's held several academic posts, including Professor at Southampton Business School uh, in the UK, Director of CECOM, the UK Na National Centre for Network-Based Learning. Um, currently a, a, a partner with Tulsa, which was previously known as the 70-20-10 into uh, Institute. He has been a keynote and invited speaker at many international events around the world. He's a well-known figure in workplace learning and where he's known, he's known as the 702010 man. In fact, I very cheekily uh, titled the episode where I interviewed him as, have you got any other numbers, Charles? Don <laughs> Donald, I can't believe there will be that many of our list listeners who haven't heard of 702010. But where do the numbers come from? For those who haven't, we just haven't been paying attention or perhaps people in the, on the more educational side of learning. And how do these numbers add to the picture you've been building for us of workplace workflow learning? Okay. So so Charles, yeah, I, I, he's a good friend of mine as well. And, and Charles, you know, is, as I said earlier, a real practitioner. This is somebody who's seen it, done it, got several T-shirts around mm -hmm. implementing this stuff in very large global organizations. So that should make us sit up and listen to him. And he is a fan of 70, 2010, but as he never tires of telling people, don't get obsessed by the numbers. These are not sort of absolute numbers. You know, they are, this is a heuristic, a sort of, you know, a rough guide, rule of thumb, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of shifting us from the old order taking the thing that we've been talking about, just build courses towards this performance paradigm we've been discussing. Now, you asked an interesting question, where does it come from? And Charles is really good in this. Uh, we have Jay Cross and uh, all the other theorists I've mentioned, Marsic, uh, Gloria Geary, Jay Cross, they also have evidence like this. And there are lots of examples of this. And they come around the seven, you know, they break down roughly into that area, but not not exactly some of them. But for Charles, there's a very specific study from the Center of Creative Leadership. And it was quite a small study, about, mm -hmm. about 200 people. And this goes back, this is back 40, 40 years or so ago. And what they did is they, looked, they interviewed 600 and odd key learning, uh, the interviewers collected the key learning events, which they then distilled down into categories. Now, the two people who did this are Eichinger and Lombardo, if you're interested mm -hmm. yep. in the actual study itself. And when they broke down and looked at how people really did learn in the workplace, it seemed to break down into three categories. Uh, the 70, 20, 10. So what are the three characters? Uh, what are these three categories? Well, the first, the 70%, is this learning in the workplace? You know, in other words, you've got that stuff to do. You're learning by doing it. You're almost doing it unconsciously because you've got to get on with it and solve the problems. So you're learning in the workplace, 70%, just that. The next 20% is learning from others. In other words, if you get stuck or whatever, you turn to somebody else or you ask people to someone to help you or you go and seek advice. So 70% just work, 20% from other people, and only 10% was formal learning and reading. Reading was included in the category there, formal learning and others courses. Only 10% of your learning is courses. Isn't that interesting? Now, if this is true empirically, and this is what Jay Cross thought it was about an 80-20 split, uh, so very similar in many ways. Uh, uh, Je you know, Jennings isn't saying this is, uh, as I said, an, an absolute set of numbers here, but boy, even if I'm wrong by a little, even if the error rate is plus and minus mm. five, ten percent, it's still so astounding. Yeah. It is so big that we need to pay attention. Now, Jenny's thought that L and D just focuses on the ten percent, so he calls it ten percent or ten percent plus. You know, with, with its absolute focus on all these courses that they, they seem to want to deliver. Now, what did you think the problem with that is? Well, if you're just like a waiter taking an order, then people would just, yeah, sure. The business comes to you and say they always come because you're L and D, and they think that all you do is courses. They say we need a course on X. You deliver a course on X without doing any of the analysis and diagnosis on what the actual problem is. 
you build a course, you don't even measure whether it works or not, because hardly ever, anybody ever really evaluates learning. So the managers that ordered the course are happy, they have ticked that box, okay? You're happy because you've got L&D budget in your inner job, tick that box. The learners feel as though they've made progress because they've been on a course, tick that box. But actually, those boxes have all been ticked, but there's no real, you know, do we know that this is what? No, we don't. In actual fact, the 70 20 10 metric that, uh, would suggest that you've done the wrong thing. You've, you've, you're just like a, tre you know, this treadmill. And he has a great, a great phrase for this. He calls it the conspiracy of convenience. Of convenience. Yes. <laughs> I love that conspiracy of convenience. Of course, it's convenient to build courses because you get the budget, you execute, you deliver, job done. Hmm. But this reduces us to this sort of treadmill, reduces L and D to a sort of course treadmill, a sort of subsidiary order taking role, like the waiter or waitress, you know, in a, in a restaurant. It's not, you know, you're you're not being a strategic partner in any sense there. You know, there's no room for this sort of notion of. Learning being a process, a process of continuous improvement, delivering stuff when people need it, as opposed to when you timetable your course and start batching people through. So there isn't any real alignment with organizational goals. Goals. There may be a little bit because the management have ordered these courses, but they don't know anything about learning. You're supposed to be the expert and you should be going back according to Charles and saying, no, stop here. This may not be a training problem at all. It may be another type of problem. Now, he also thinks, I think this is really interesting because he th he's thought a lot about this, Charles, and I think he's really right on this one point. And that he thinks that HR, when HR took over learning in L&D, he thought that was a bad thing. And let, let me explain why he thinks that's a bad thing. He thinks that he thought that HR was essentially about paying rations for individuals, right? So they, they're essentially about, you know, you know, make sure that all the mechanics of your job are right, your holidays, your pay, your overtime, your terms and conditions, your contract, mm. and so on. So this absolute focus on the individual and that those sort of outputs, he thinks has massively distorted L&D, okay? And that we do the same. We just deliver stuff, you know? We give them answers to questions, that's in, which is why L&D mostly does schooling and not training. It's mostly like delivering courses, theoretical courses as opposed to, actual the real knowledge and skills that people need to actually do their job better mm. and that he thinks that l d should move away from this conspiracy of convenience away from order taking away from that mindset towards doing what is right and that's doing more analysis and fighting back against the business saying don't you don't need to spend this money actually this is better this is a better approach based around the 70 20 10 sort of metric but it's, it, don't get hung up on that. You know, they're not, he's not obsessed by this. He just says that's the starting point when we think of organizational learning. And I think he's right there. And it goes back to all the people we've mentioned earlier, way back to Tolman we did in Leighton Learning, you yeah. know, and, and Rats in a Maze. And he actually yeah. learned by just sort of juggling around the maze, Marsic, Cross, Thorndike, all these sort of people that we've mentioned previously. You know, it, it's a real, you know, I think it may be as little as four percent of formal learning solutions actually, you know, actually work. <laughs> That's an astonishing number, but he thinks that it may have been almost catastrophic in terms of its delivery methods. And that brings us to the technology side once again. You know, we're only now beginning to understand that AI and learning experience platforms actually allow you to do this performance support. Mm -hmm. You know, getting the right thing at the right time in response to Mosher's moments of needs, we're starting to see technology emerge that does attempt to do this. And I think that's really heartening because it may mean that we get away from the mass delivery of courses towards a, a more sophisticated set of tools and blend. So it's time to sum up. Um, and if I kick off by um, just some of the thoughts that uh, have been going through my mind as, as, as you've been talking. Um, so it's been interesting that I've, I've been working a bit on uh, the spacing effect following on from a white paper that you wrote. And it does seem that if you follow the spacing effect, really what happens after a course or a piece of content or an intervention is much more important than what happens in the classroom or the lecture room or whatever. The learning all happens afterwards. Why isn't that done? It's difficult and difficult in 
workplace uh, training all, always means expensive. It, it's quite hard to get things into long term memory to the extent that you can grow mastery and the automaticity you need to become an expert in a given field. So, I mean, it's clear that that effort, if we were really to do it, is something that you want to target on the stuff that actually needs to be learned. And all this stuff from Guy Wallace Forward is all about looking at problems and saying, does this really need to be training? Does re and, and actually doing less training. <laughs> uh, all of these people in one way or, or another, you know, the nudge people included, are trying to stop us doing bits of training that really we shouldn't. So that per perhaps so that we can focus where we really need to put that effort in, where people really need to remember stuff. Because very often they don't need to remember stuff. You just need to know it now. You know, you don't have to learn the principles of how um, printers work. You just have to need, need to know how to, 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 to kind of solve that particular problem when the ink runs out or whatever, and you can't get it to work. Um, so it's, it's kind of about targeting your effort. And one thing it's making me think is that that move from using the word training to using the word learning is actually quite a good idea in retrospect, because training is something that the training department deliver as learning is something that the learner does. But there is a, a question in the, in the middle of this that came up for me, which seems like a bit of a contradiction, is that um, <clears throat> in one of your papers, you talk about how important it is that le learners have autonomy. Autonomy is very important for people to, to be able to learn. And yet you have Dick Clark talking about direct instruction. Um, nudge seems to take away a bit of um, autonomy because it's about redesigning the system to just make it easier for people to, to, to do what you want to. Where does, where does it sit, Donald, really, that balance between, say, direct instruction and learner autonomy within all this? Yeah, that, that's a good question because, of course, these are not sort of mutually exclusive binary type yeah. things, you know. The, it's about the blend almost between, uh, let's say, how much formal versus informal, direct versus indirect type stuff you're going to do the other. And the pendulum has swung more towards the indirect or informal because that the evidence suggests that that's how people really learn in the mm. real world, mostly. So the, the empirical evidence would suggest that that's true. Uh, that, but, but of course, you still want that intense training for doctors before they come out and practice on your on real human beings and bodies. So that it's not as if formal learning hasn't gone away and uh, has gone away in any sense or dis disappears. But let's focus on something you said there. It was really interesting on space practice. And uh, you know, we just finished this big bit of research on space mm -hmm. practice, looking at how companies like Duolingo actually use space practice. Now, they started off with a very simple logarithmic thing like, OK, you because know, learning is a process, not an event, but training is mostly yeah. events, you know, so learning is a process, not an event. What the process of space practice actually works. The evidence is quite clear on that. Uh, but how do you do it now? This is how clever the technology is becoming now. It did start with just a logarithmic, OK, do it an hour, do what, let's say one hour, one day, one week, one month type pattern out so that you start reinforcing the learning forward in time. Now, Duolingo then moved on to a thing called Lightner, which is a, a space practice algorithm in a sense, almost like you have to get everything into the top boxes after, so they know what you get wrong. And they're constantly focusing or targeting, was the mm -hmm. word you used, John. They're targeting the things you got wrong to make sure that you do them again and again until you get them right and everything flips up to the top box where everything's you've learned that aspect of a language. They then moved on to something incredibly sophisticated around AI, and they talk about the half-life of forgetting. Now, when you're learning a language, let's say you're learning Russian, and you have a phrase like, excuse me, skazhiti bezhalsta, you're saying, uh, you know, excuse me, and then what they do for every individual learner, they work out the half-life, and it was how long they think it's going to take you to forget that work word it's a complete flip <laughs> it's not about teaching you it necessarily they know in advance how quickly you're going to forget it which is why they do all the push and pull techniques you know they're still doing a lot of direct instruction in duolingo but they're also nudging you mm. you know they're also using space practice techniques incredibly sophisticated algorithms that are targeted at you john as an individual when you are learning russian so that suddenly the technology is catching up with the theory and learning experience platforms, the sophisticated algorithms around space practice, not only 
space practice, retrieval practice, interleaving, all of these things that the evidence tells us actually works. As Dick Clark keeps saying, go back to the research base, see what works, and then get out into the real world and apply it using technology. It's only now that we've got the technology that does all this smart stuff, sometimes good teachers do in any way, that we'll be able to achieve many of the goals that all of these theorists, from Guy Wallace, Mosher, uh, the, the Nudge guys, Thaler, uh, through to Charles Jennings, mm. recommended which is think of learning as a process and not an event and stop building. Don't stop building courses entirely. There are some great examples where you need a really dose of formal learning. There is nothing wrong with that. But if that's all you're doing, then you're wasting huge amounts of money and time because it's inappropriate. Okay, most of the so time. it's not just about a crude binary between resources. This needs no. resource. This needs a course because actually the, the course ought to be as you say, a process, not an event, and that goes into workflow as well. In other words, you're kind of reminded uh, judicious intervals within your working life to practice the stuff that you're learning. Yes, I mean, most learning tasks, I mean, the, to be fair, I think for towards the formal course side, it's actually if you pick up, uh, you know, a new skill like learning how to make a stained glass window or a new musical instrument, about a very formal tuition and course type stuff is really useful, especially around the basics and so on. Uh, but as you become more autonomous, then the need for that mm. lessens. And that's a lesson in a different sense of the word that we've not learned in the L&D yet. We tend to have this one size fits all batching people through formal events, which are formally timetabled and are called courses. And, you know, I myself have been you know, because I was on the boards of lots of uh, public sector organisations, I was constantly being sent on diversity and equality courses. But, you know, well, you know, how many do you want me to take? You know, because you're just batching numbers mm. of people through this stuff. You're not thinking what their actual needs are or you're not thinking about the organisation at all. You're just timetabling courses. So I think we have to be careful about this over focus on events. I said at the beginning that this stuff was fairly recent, but actually we've been hearing it for well over a decade now, I think, in, in in our world. Is the message getting through? Do you think we're getting there? Oh, I think so. So in the, if you just look at the market data, for example, so, you know, a company we know well, Learning Pool, you know, Learning Pool have been going for a while and we uh, more recently built an LXP. They ha they were selling an LMS catalogs of content. We're a content company in that sense. Suddenly, you know, they have a, an LXP, a very good one called Stream, and they get snapped up immediately for 150 million, you know, out of the blue. Same with Absorb. You know, hundreds of millions are going into this type of tech now because people know it works. Duolingo, and people dismissed it as an irrelevance. But, you know, it's got, you know, tens of millions of regular users every day. Which Which other educational institution can say that? None. You know, no university has that. They're down at the, at the best tens of thousands, whereas these systems, because they use these contemporary techniques and very, very smart technology, have millions of users. So I think the whole pendulum is swinging towards, I think that's mainly, I think this is, you know, people say, oh, it's all about learning, not about the technology, but sometimes it's about the technology. Sometimes a technology, the learning theory has to lay silent because we can't execute it. Suddenly a technology comes along that allows us to execute it. And I think that's what what's starting to happen now with LXPs, artificial intelligence, algorithm, the algorithmic approach, nudges, notifications, all the smart stuff. And of course we know this because this is the world we live in when we're online. You know, all these interfaces that we'd use on Netflix, you know, when we use uh, Google for search, these are all mediated by AI, you know. Our whole, the whole online experience is personalized now, and that's what learning has to catch up with. You know, we have to get, get with the program here and understand that the world of technology now is no longer batching courses. It's almost as if L&D and the online thing is still stuck in the old HTML web site, web page portal idea, whereas the world has moved on. Everything's much more dynamic and processed and personalized. Well, the learning theory will never lay silent on this podcast. Thank you very much, Donald. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you, John. It's a pleasure as always. Great Minds on Learning comes from the Learning Hack team and is produced by John Helmer. Sound edit is by Isaac Peacock. Social media by Jay Curtis. 
The podcast is based on a series of blog posts written by Donald Clark, and we'd like to thank Donald for his kind collaboration in this project. Next time, Donald and John take on a subject closely allied to the one covered in this episode as they discuss informal learning. Join us, won't you?